Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Piano Star Masterclass. I'm your host Brian Lin. Today,、um, during the live stream, you can ask us any questions in the chat, and we will do our best to answer them. You can also sign up to be a performer for these masterclasses and get a chance to perform for our live audience. Co-hosting with me today is Sherry Kim, our communication and outreach director. Hi, everybody.、Um, be sure to also check out our newest virtual competition, the Piano Star International Competition for professional and amateur piano students ages 18 and under. And the deadline is in roughly a month. So today's guest teacher is pianist and actor Konstantin Sukovetsky, and he is a recipient of over 16 awards and is an alumnus of the Juilliard School. Where he has earned his bachelor's, master's, and artist diploma degrees, he is now an adjunct faculty at Juilliard, where he is teaching narrative musician. And today he will be discussing that this is the synergy between acting and music making. It's an honor to have you on the show, Constantine. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. Well, we're going to just jump right into it.、It's, uh, we only got thirty minutes, anyways. So. Why this topic? What got you into、um, narrative musicianship? Well, you know, I spent、um, my entire professional life, in a way, practicing it, and I think for the first decade, I didn't even realize I was doing it because I had a great fortune of kind of falling into professional acting as a teenager,、um, and as I was doing it, I lived two parallel lives. You know, I.、Um, Was a pianist, and then I was an actor, and it just sort of switched from one to the other. And it only with the passage of time I realized that I'm actually using one for the other, and vice versa. That that one informs the other, and I began to、uh, consciously employ certain things that I did as an you know actor、uh, into.、Um, Integrate them into my work as a、uh, musician, as a concert pianist or performer,、uh, composer, chair musician, all of it. And、uh, so it took a long time for me to realize that in fact it's one and the same. And wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's amazing.、Um, so how did you even get into acting? Well, that was literally、uh, a happenstance.、Uh, the、uh, Uh, one of Moscow's major theaters were staging a play that was controversial in every sense. It was a first play、uh, that was directed by a foreign director after the fall of Soviet Union.、Uh, it was directed by François Hoche of Switzerland、uh, on the stage of Moscow State Satire Theater, which is a theater for comedy、uh, plays. And it was a French play by Roger Vitrac. Which is really not very funny. It was a black comedy, and everybody dies, and,、oh. uh, <laughs> and <laughs> they called up my school,、uh, the Central Moscow Music School, and they wanted a, a boy who could play the piano in a play and not be scared、uh, and you know sort of run away, and、uh, that's how it all began. And then as、um, the process uh, started, uh, my role got bigger and bigger because I loved. The stage and、um, the director Francois and everybody thought that I was sort of natural, and so they expanded what was really kind of a very smallish couple lines role into a bigger uh, uh, role, and then I ended up composing music also for the play、um, because I was a double major in comedy.、Wow. So it was pretty cool. So、um, you talk about.、Uh, Narrative musicianship. So before before your first acting role, you actually never had any uh, acting uh, uh, lessons or classes, right? And then after that,、um, you had some acting experience, and somehow you tied it into your、uh, musician、yes. life. So can you tell us a little bit about what narrative musicianship is and how? I guess the today's you know main topic. How does that correlate into music making? Of course. Look, I mean,、uh, I、uh, almost feel like I'm、uh, saying certain slogans that have become the、uh, the hallmark of narrative musicianship. But we, as as musicians, as all performers, we are storytellers. We are talking to people on a level that is not just、um, exposing them to beauty. 
like playing beautiful music or I know reading a great verse, we are telling them stories that are only meaningful if they're meaningful to us. So the, the gateway into being a good storyteller is to care about the stories that you're telling. And that means that you have to connect to those stories and they have to resonate within you in order to be truthful, in order to be authentic. And um, so the better artists, the, the you know, Horowitzes and Martha Argerichs of the world, whether or not they realize that or not, they're narrative musicians because they are telling us stories that um, compel us, that move us, and that ring very true and authentic. And uh, I just realized that as a, as a young music student, there was never a course, there was no way to learn that. People alluded to it in, 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 in different ways to a different degree. Uh, but there was never a system that actually tells you, well, this is how you approach this. So uh, narrative musicianship, the course, is a blueprint as to how to read music as you read the script and how to approach being a musician as, a, as an actor, as a storyteller, and tell the truth. Got it. And uh, this course, uh, as you, I think, told us before the show, it's a semester-long course, right, at Juilliard? Yes, it's 20 hours. So, so let's get into a little, uh, de a little bit detail details about this. Sure. Um, what kind of, what sort of uh, materials do you teach uh, in this course? And what sort of homework do you give your, your students? What should they know? Well, uh, there's there's quite a lot of reading, and we're I, I I don't like having required anything, so I always call it a supplemental suggestion. And uh, That's nice. <laughs> our, our our bible for for this semester is Stanislavski uh, Stanislavski's book, An Actor Prepares, and it is his probably most important thesis about the method acting. What, what does that actually mean? And he really uh, writes it as a, as a almost a fiction story. It's kind of remarkable. Um, he, whilst it's his own experience, he describes it in third person almost. And uh, it is about this young actor who is working in a school with a great director who is uh, telling, um, teaching them about what is great art and how to be uh, an artist, not merely a pretender uh, or a puppeteer, but, but how to live uh, in your character, how to live your art. And most of the things that he's talking about are so completely applicable to music um, that I think it's a book that every musician must read. What are some of the ways that you can sort of um, get into, you know, uh, knowing yourself and, and getting to uh, being narrative uh, in music. What, what I, I want to get some details about, you know, when you're playing, like, let's say, uh, since this is a piano class, when you're playing a, a piece of music, how, how do you how how do you use uh, your experience um, as an actor? Well, first of all, you have to you have to become very aware of yourself and of where you are. So everything begins with um, an, an, an attention exercise and relaxation exercise, right? Where you are closing your eyes and you're listening to, uh, to your own brain. You're listening to your body. You're listening to the room you're in. And then you're trying to hear what's outside. You're trying to refocus your attention from within to without, right? So you're, you're uh, becoming gradually aware of the layers of the world around you. That's very important. I mean, we just never do that. You know, we never sit for 10 minutes and think, well, let me just hear the silence or the lack of silence. Maybe there is a stove or a car passing by or an air conditioner, whatever. Listen to that. There is a a vacuum to it, right? If it's a continuous sound, there is like this monotony to it. Once you accept that and hear it, then you move on to the next thing, like what is outside, what, what is all around you. And then and then you start becoming self-aware and you say, well, what, what am I feeling right now? And you really kind of try to be neutral, but then you say, well, 
let me recall the moment when I was really happy. And then you try to feel it. And then you say, well, and now let me recall the moment I was really unhappy. Something terrible happened. And then how does that, where do you feel it? Where does it go in your body? So that's where it all sort of begins. It's kind of like um, meditation almost. Yeah. I feel like that's some, that's, I feel like asking New Yorkers, we're all New Yorkers here, such a difficult task to even find that timidness, but right. it's helpful. I think even not even just being a musician, but as a person, right? Just to have that quiet time and quiet space to yourself. Yeah, that's great. Of course. And then, so, so that, that's the, just the very, very first step uh, in, into sort of the system. And then, and then you, you're always, uh, Stanislavski always talks about the magic if. What if it happened to me? Whatever that it may be. So if you're playing Les Adieux, you know, uh, what if you said goodbye to someone? And what does that mm -hmm. mean? When you're playing Claire de Lune, what if it happened to you? Well, we all have seen the moon, but we all had different experience seeing it. Where were you? How old were you? Were you happy, unhappy, alone? Were you with a, um, a significant other? Were you with your parents? Were you a child? Were you an adult? All of that matters. It all informs your interpretation. But without thinking about those things and recalling your human experience of them, how can we begin to interpret it? When, how, so how does one train themselves to become more self-aware? Or in, in other words, uh, whether it, they're training themselves or, or piano teachers training their students. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you know, being aware of your surroundings and, 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 and being aware of the silence. Um, do you do that uh, when you're practicing on stage? Uh, what sort of things do you tell your students? Of course. Well, I mean, I, I do a lot of different things myself and I like to experiment with myself. Yes. And, uh, you know, and Stanislavski always said, you know, don't follow my method slavishly. Uh, invent your own. So we are creative. In, basically. We're, yeah, we're in the process of creating a method mm -hmm. every single time we perform or work as an artist. So while the method is great as a, again, a blueprint or a guide line, if you will. It is not. Uh, it is not a Bible, <laughs> as much as I like to to say it is. It is not. So we, we create our own experience as we as we go. But um, well, I personally like. I always come into the. Uh, or for instance, when I perform, I come to the theater to the concert hall hours and hours before, and I want to be there, uh, live there. Uh, I always come literally three, four hours uh, early, and I bring uh, my belongings with me, something that is mine, and I plant it somewhere so that this entire space becomes mine. It is no longer some concert hall somewhere. It, uh, so my bag is over there, and my eyeglasses case is over here, and you know, and my shoes are under that chair, and, and I inhabit the place as though I inhabit my home. So by the time the audience comes, I welcome them into my world as opposed to invading theirs. So in a way, you sort of treat the concert hall as a um, a scene in a movie. Uh, where, where a theater set, absolutely. And I make it mine and I plant little things here and there. And, and that one of the theater techniques is, you know, how do you make a set your own? Well, you have a little secret things you do. You know, you put a little bit of your stuff here and there and you know you, you 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 spend some time you drink a cup of tea on a chair that is part of the set and then you spill the tea on it and then you wipe it and clean it and it ties you to that object it becomes meaningful it has a memory a tactile experience you know you spoil the chair and then you clean it up but it's no longer just some piece of common property it becomes you part of your narrative so I feel like that like actually helps even performers not to get so frightened by the stage as we always hear, you know, the students having stage fright. If you're saying that if we make the stage more of like our own comfort zone, depending on these items, then we can actually not be as afraid of the of stage. Course. Absolutely. And then you really, uh, the stage becomes your refuge. It's not something you run away from, it's something you run to from the world. It becomes much safer 
the the outside world, and and the fears and the stage anxieties go away because you feel that uh, this is this is the only place which is yours and and that um, is safe and welcoming to you. And there are wonderful exercises that uh, Stanislavski describes in the book that is easier done with professional lighting in the stage, but he used to sit the actors and create a spotlight on them that was very, very tiny, right? So basically you eliminated, uh, illuminated like about this much space around you. So that is your entire world is right there. And that's your first level of awareness and everything else is black. So it's easy to feel very comfortable there because you just don't see anything else but your own hands. Um, and then there is a second stage and all of a sudden it's a much larger th circle and you see the room, you see furniture, you may see other people and that becomes your bigger picture world. And then it's bigger still. So, it, 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 and it goes on exponentially until, you know, you see the 2000 people out in the audience. And in that exercise is, is, is the importance of making it yours, surrendering into that space and not being afraid of it enlarging. So as it gets bigger, so is your power over it. So that when finally you're alone on the stage in front of all these people, you can bring them into that small circle as opposed to trying to create a wall and say, oh my God, I'm afraid of you. You're judging me. So a lot of this will really help our performers when they're on stage and, and, and to create this sense of uh, self-awareness and uh, you know just being at home when they're on stage. But I, I, I do have a question about when they're at the preparing stage, right? So the, one of the differences, I think, uh, between uh, acting and and performing is that um, when 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 you're acting, you get to have different takes, right? You if you if you mess up once, you can oh. have another take and another take. Oh, and the movies are television, not <laughs> in theater. Uh, oh, right, not in theater. That's right. That's true. But but in movies, uh, there is. But I'm just wondering. Um, when you're performing, I'm sorry. When you're practicing, when you when you're when when you're at home by yourself, uh, do you still uh, do this kind of exercise? And, and how how does it differ from when I'm you're on stage? Where you have the most fun is experimenting. Is is how do you get to you choose any piece really? You select a Chopin Nocturne, okay. Play it um, in a state of absolute exaltation. You know, just think of your happiest moment in your life your best birthday, your marriage proposal, your, you know, winning an award, whatever, whatever it be, there are no rules, right? So whatever your experience is, you choose the day that you think was, you know, one of the best days of your life. And you try to remember what it feels like. And then you imbue the music with that, right? So you play a given piece in a state of that utter excitement and that utter happiness. And just listen, I also recommend that everybody film themselves uh, because that's really um, a great tool to review and really study how uh, how you operate, what happens. Mm -hmm. But um, so you, you see sort of how you play that and then you, you know, take a moment, uh, take a break if you need, and then you remember the day that you lost someone you love that you thought, you know, the life was over, something was really, really horrible that happened, and you play the same music imbued with that level of opposite. And see how different it is and how it affects your interpretation, how it affects your touch, your sound, the tempo, your rubato. It will affect everything. And um, we just don't pay attention to it. We never come to interpreting music from the state uh, of emotional being of a fictional character, right? We, we never say, well, when I'm going, when I'm stepping on the stage right now to play Rachmaninoff second, am I a 40 year old man or am I a 15 year old girl? Am I divorced or am I a father of six? Am I um, ill or am I well? And, uh, Am I somewhere near the ocean or is it snowing outside? All those things matter. So uh, just to clarify, when you're saying 
um, you, you are, when when you say "am I something something," does that mean that you you want you want to imagine yourself being in that situation, or does that mean what you are, who you are, changes your interpretation? You have to feel it. You have to feel so, so the mood of the music. Something of those things, right? Right. Or or, or if not, if you say just for sake of an uh, example, um, you know, let's say I um, am playing a piece of music where I believe the character protagonist, um, you know, is is a mother of many children. Got it. So you you become... The- and I'm not, I, I don't have children. Right. I'm, I'm a male. Right. So I can't be mother physically. Right. right. Then I call upon everything in my memory in my human experience personally with my mother, my grandmother, the close, those closest to me who are mothers. And, and I try to recall being in a moment where them define, defining themselves as a mother was tangible to me when I, when I understood it. And, and then I try to identify with that. And so that I can then project it onto myself and feel authentic emotion that I think is right for the music. Right, right. I'm just. So, go oh, ahead. yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm wondering okay, let's say that you're, uh, as a performer or the student, you're, you understand these emotions mm-hmm. and you're thinking about them, but then how do you begin to even translate that if, if it's, not just um, like the tempo or the dynamics or the phrasing aspect, but is it also physical movement, like how you're moving your arms or how, and I guess, do you have any tips? Cause I have a few students who I'm, you know, really trying to get them into that world. We talk about character a lot, but for the life of them, they're just very stiff. Right. Well, first, uh, that's why the relaxation is so important. Stiffness is our enemy in all yeah. performing arts, whether you're a singer, an actor, a pianist, or, or a percussionist, or a violinist, or a tuba player, uh, tension is a killer. So we have to get rid of it. And, and we have to do meditation, exercising, breathing exercise, whatever it takes to get rid of it. So that is just to, to put it out there, right? Okay. Uh, on releasing tension. But then once once that's done, you, look, you have to determine who you are in who you are in that music, and that determines how you move. If you are an older character, older person uh, who is tired, your motions are slower. You can't move fast. So the you know quick jerking of the head and you know f- uh, flamboyant gestures. Will will immediately kill that. So if you were let's say you're playing a I don't know a later Schubert sonata or uh, you know impromptu, and you're creating uh, successfully as a musician that sort of musical landscape of stillness and um, certain sense of nearness to the end, which is what sh- later Schubert's music is in, very uh, colorfully represents and historically also. And then all of a sudden you have these sort of, you know, uh, gestures that contradict that. Well, what does that tell the audience that that immediately jars them because they thought you were somebody else that you are now and they don't believe you anymore. So if you're playing something that requires a sense of exhaustion and a sense of um, tiredness, you need to look for lack of a better one. I mean, not look tired as in like, oh my God, for him. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you have to, your body needs to represent that. And, uh, you know, being older, moving slower, being somewhat less um, agile, sometimes even more stiff, if you will. On the other hand, if you're playing, you know, something that represents youth and vibrance or, or say water, you know, jodo, you know, yes, you can actually use your long of the neck to move along the top of the keyboard that will make it actually look nicer, help you play better, and will, in fact, look kind of liquid. Interesting. Amazing. Um, 
obviously you are a tremendous performer uh you, being in the especially uh, i'm very familiar with the ad program at julia and how hard it is um to you, you have to be basically a, a, a successful and com- accomplished performer to even be considered uh let alone getting in so uh, i i just wonder um because uh we we're talking about sort of this um almost supernatural kind of outside of the actual playing and and technique side of of piano playing today but obviously there are hundreds of different uh ways that people people talk about piano playing and how how they improve their play, piano playing i wondered for you personally how much of your success as a performer do you contribute to you know this 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 um this uh self awareness this this uh musicianship that you possess and how much of it is the more technical and and you know the 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 basics uh the, you know what, what Sherry mentioned about you know the dynamic tempo you know some people uh, they 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 prefer to attack it from that angle i i just want wonder you know from your personal experience is is this narrative musicianship is this your secret sauce to becoming such a a successful performer well to me they're one and the same you see because you can't uh do one without the other for many years i didn't even realize i was doing it uh practicing narrative musicianship uh, you know is it is it just practicing the piano because there it's not so much even a secret sauce it's a combination of a multiple sources do you know i mean <laughs> I'm really crafty when it comes to technical practicing i believe in rhythms and i practice hand separately and i you know use all the good old technical things to uh, you know get your fingers to remember where to go but the important thing to do is to to have this self aware practice which comes again from the care so you have to determine um and as time goes by i realized that what i did earlier on i didn't create determinations whether um what my character was right away so i would practice something one way but then i would realize that it needs to be played the other way so i wasted hours and hours and hours of time practicing something with a different body language with a different degree of uh, muscular intensity that i will no longer use right so i have to throw that away and repractice it in the way that is right for for the piece and then um of course that is twice as hard you know once you learn something to unlearn something takes double the effort so right. if you approach technique with through the lens of narrative musicianship you're just saving yourself a whole lot of time and and <laughs> and effort and burden of having to redo things over and over again definitely it's definitely uh 10 times harder to correct a mistake than yeah. if you just do things right from the yeah. very first time and you know at the end of the day um we all are doing we we all are pursuing the same end right we all are telling the story it's just that there are different ways of telling them and narrative musicianship is simply a um a set of uh, tools that helps you get there but it's not you don't have to do it it's not the only way you can do it any other way but at the end of the day we were kind of aiming to arrive at the same spot that spot is being where people relate to what you do in a personal way you know when when the audience uh within minutes of you touching the keyboard or, st- or violin or starting to play your instrument uncontrollably surrenders to your narrative to your world they cry their laugh they're happy they're empathetic with you and uh that is real art and that is what narrative musicianship is really it's just that it's a system that tells you xyz you know do this exercise read this book think about that and it will get, help you get there faster but you don't have that's, to that's awesome thank 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 you again so much for just sharing um this wealth of knowledge and um to our audience if you are interested in learning more in depth about narrative musicianship you can check out Constantine's course at the Juilliard School uh which is starting soon right you said yeah, right on the first the enrollment for the fall is, is already uh, closed but there will be of course spring so 
check out vr.edu forward slash evening. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, it is now 830 and it's time to begin the masterclass portion. And so we have our uh, first student backstage, I believe. Yes. And her name is Varia. She is 10 years old and she'll be playing for us Haydn, Sonata, and D major. Um, first movement of that. So yeah. yes. I'll leave you guys. We'll be just backstage-ish. And um, if you have any questions, just let us know. I do want to introduce uh, Varia a little bit more. Uh, she is one of our former um, uh, winners of, of a uh, our piano star uh, 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 showcase uh, yeah. back in back in May. That was uh, basically the the the, the former uh, uh, North America version of the new piano star international competition. So, um, welcome back, Varia. Very good to see yeah. you. <laughs> All right, so leave it up to you guys. Wonderful. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you, Raya. Yeah, you too. <laughs> you look terrific. I'm so looking forward to hearing you. I got the music here, so I will just, even though I played the piece myself, but I want to um, consult the music when you play, starting your own time. Yeah, okay, thank you. So good. Excellent job. So you play it very, very well. I think you've got the right spirit for the tempo. It's just that sometimes you run away with it a little bit. So 
my recommendation overall right away would be to just hold back a little bit in terms of moving forward of the tempo. Does it make sense? You probably know yourself, right? Sometimes you just kind of start going, going, and it feels like it's getting out of control. So one of the simplest tricks for that is, uh, speaking of the tips, here's a tip. Whenever you start feeling like it's starting to go forward and you can't quite control it, slow down. So make yourself feel like you're pulling back enough to start feeling you're going in a slow motion. In reality, you will be perfectly in time. So in order to stay on time, you need to have a perception of being too slow. Does it make sense? Yeah. Because you're being too fast and you think you're on time. Yeah. Right? So that's just overall thing. So now, um, and you have a very good spirit to the piece, right? So it's a very humorous piece. In, in Haydn, um, sonatas much much of them sound like symphonic works or even opera buffa works right do you know what that means opera buffa like an opera piece right but buffa is a, is being a operative word it means funny it's a comical opera right so it's usually all sorts of crazy things happen people hide under the table and in the curtains and their mistaken identities and you know, people fall face down into a cake and that sort of thing, right? So there's a lot of mayhem going on. And, but the care, it's all in very good spirit, right? So it's all very positive. And you have a lot of humorous acting and humorous personality. Oh, it's okay. It's 21st century. We all have them, <laughs> right? So what you can do is you can be even more humorous than you already are because your general sense of humor reads in the piece, but there are things you can highlight a little bit more to make it even more sort of, you know, here and then you're over there, right? Is like these characters really chasing each other. And, um, and it all starts with really giving as much independence dynamically to both hands. Even on the first line right here, in your left hand, when you go right, your first gesture is uh, this. And then, right, so it basically reverses itself. You have a, a slur and an, an accent on, on a relatively strong beat, but then you have slurs that start on an off beat. And then in itself is kind of like a humorous. It, it, it literally is like those characters are, you know, one is doing this and the other one is doing that, right? They're just doing things that aren't exactly the same. In fact, they're quite opposite. So you can emphasize that a little bit more and then when you notice how your hands are going in the same direction right there, right? But now they're gonna go in opposite direction. So all you have to do is phrase your left hand a little bit stronger with a slight crescendo going up and hear it just, just even playing it once or, or a few times preferably for yourself will help you, your ears to follow it. So, so you want to hear, right? And on top of it, you have right hand doing its own thing, which is, and so when you put them together, you have almost two people and now a dialogue. Do you hear that? Yeah. Just yeah. try that. Okay. Uh, from the yeah, from the beginning. Okay. Very good, excellent. I would not use pedal on the first downbeat because you don't really have a legato there. You want to be staccato. You want to... so you can use pedal on on here. 
just touch up, touch up. Yeah, and no pedal there. Very good. And now slightly different character, right? Much more legato, but with a funky accent. Very good. But you see how you can have two different characters already in that first phrase. You have this character that go, and then you have much, much more different kind of a character that is contradicting or commenting on the other as opposed to just one thing happening throughout. Now, um, further on down the page, I would recommend, again, allowing your left hand to have a little bit more role in what's going on because you have this. <laughs> So you want to make sure that you phrase that as much as we can. Raya, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so just phrase left hand a little bit more. And, yeah. Right. So when you're playing both hands, listen to this. Just have that in your head. Okay. Right? Try that. Wait, so should I play like... Yeah, right, right from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry. You see, it's very good to practice that because that, that you're right now your ears don't really hear that as a as a parallel line but yeah. if you practice that i'm not gonna put you on the spot but practice that on your own so that you can really play it as though that's the melody right i mean as though that's the whole music right so you can go oh. and so once you learn how to listen to that your whole passage work will become alive because it's very good, but it is a little bit muddy. You know, it's kind of you're like playing it, but but I'm not hearing very tangibly, right? You're not telling the story with it. And that that is apropos our conversation about narrative musicianship, that where you create the narrative. Whatever the narrative here, you can say, well, I don't know, I'm chasing somebody, right? Uh, or we, we're playing hide and seek and they're running and now I'm running and, and that is what's going on. And um, so once you get to that ending, you can phrase, always shape the scale. So whenever you have a scale, the basic rule, and of course there will be exceptions, but at the, for the time being, let's not have exceptions. The, the rule is as it goes up, you slightly crescendo and as it comes down, you decrescendo. But most importantly is that you give the scale a direction so that it, it has this kind of a shape to it, right? So you reach to the top and then you come down and this, so your music is this. And this is an accompaniment. So you can really change the way that it sounds, give it slightly different color because you're playing it with one brush stroke. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Because you're playing. Um, so it sounds like it's all one thing, but you can actually create a difference there. I mean, maybe I overdid it, but you can create an ex you know, a real difference so that then rests rests are our gift to music you know there's a saying that says that the word is silver but silence is gold so silence is gold silence is so rich 
It's where the music comes from. It's where the words come from. So enjoy the rest. Let that silence to be big. So when you play this, whatever the dynamic you do, just listen. For the sake of an exercise, sit much longer on that rest. And out of that silence, imagine this is so brand new. You don't know that it's coming. The listener doesn't know it's coming. And you have this. Right? You have this very different kind of sound, much quieter, much smaller. So there is something new. It becomes an event. Do you want to try that? Try from there. In principle, that was very good. So when you play the scale, this, finish it. What you're doing is you're, you're giving up the intention of the scale too soon. You're giving up. You're kind of relaxing there. So then this becomes something, not a second, but a third entity. Instead, finish the scale. And then you can have... Very good. Now, rest. And then when you play this in your left hand, voice the top a little bit more. Yeah, like hear the melody. This. That's your melody in the left hand. Very good. And so think of it as a melody. And it will help you very softly though, right? So on top of it you have... And so then, then it starts having really a dialogue, really, between the left hand and the right hand. Remember, you, always, you have two characters in this play. One is right hand and one is left hand. And they have to constantly speak to each other and say something to each other. Right? Um, now, do you have any particular technical question for me? Always these parts, like um, uh, the on the page uh, one, two, three, four, on the last page. Uh huh. Um, there is this. Uh, yeah. Um, and I thought, uh, how could I do so that um I can play like all the notes and pass with all the notes. Yeah. Right. Well, for, you, first of all, hold it back because you, you're that is where you're rushing, right? So you're pushing yourself forward and making it more difficult for yourself to play. But um, once you get once you get there, it's a switch of 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 positions. You have this kind of. So once you switch to the ar these broken arpeggios. Think of the positions of the hand. I would say bra I bracket everything, right? So find vertically where the chords are. So you can... Right? Sorry, I broke all the strings. And then here... So here you have this, really. So instead of having all this awkward two note units, you 
you realize that this, this is really broken that you just play the chord and you just then deep finger in the right order then you switch to this and then you switch to that does it make sense so you have like a three brackets so what i would do is i'll try to do it right now and and see if i can if you can see it so um we'll have that and we'll have this and then we'll have that so the uh, that oh, yeah i see that Do you yeah. see that uh -huh. so this is one of my favorite tricks in all of music and all of piano playing find the unit where your hand sits at its most natural position and i like visual aids so i use color pencils virtual or otherwise and uh i bracket these things for myself so i know i'm looking not at the long mass of black notes that are, look scary and awkward yeah. but within that there are smaller units of very easy things that your fingers are already on so you don't have to move anywhere wiggle anything move uh right you just have to depress the fingers in the right sequence and then move the position so you just do position 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 does it make sense yeah 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 and you can apply that to actually all of piano literature and um um uh, right hand left hand it doesn't matter so it's very useful though to really uh, mark them up because if you don't you, look i've been doing this for 35 years and i do it for myself it, it doesn't become easier with time your eyes can scan the score and create visual aids uh, fast enough. So my recommendation is just do it right in your score, bracket everything out. It makes your life easier and it makes playing so much better. And because those, it's not your technical problem. It's a perceptive problem. It, it's cognition. It's your brain. You're looking at it and you're like, oh my God, there's a lot of notes. Yeah. And you thought about it, it's already a mistake. Uh, when you really take it apart, there was really not that many notes. It's just five notes per position and then you move then you move and it's five notes each no big deal now right after that i wanted to alert you and it happens twice you have this and then you have left hand going right so you can this is a humor moment you want this is like when one character is saying i'm here i'm here and then somebody else across the stage says oh, shut up i'm here right so you have right hand going and then left hand has to interrupt and enter so you have, right create that kind of a again a dialogue in this case it's an interruption so left hand should come in a little louder and much more with much more presence than the right hand and as you play your right hand Create a crescendo, go up. And then immediately change the character. Right, so it creates a whole mise-en-scene for you. So you have these multiple characters that are all saying their own things. Try that. You can do it even more. So now for the sake of practicing, create it exaggerated, make it grotesque, make it like this. Like much, much more. Yeah, but here's the important thing. Start soft and get louder. Don't begin already loud. So the idea is to create and then right? So from both ends. 
Try that again. Very good. And now change the character and play super soft and listen to the silences. Listen to this like inter interruption. Uh, sorry. Here, you, your character doesn't know where to go. Literally, this is like, so where do I go now? What, what, am, I, uh, what am I doing? This is, this is the feeling. And then somebody says, come on. There's the door, right? That's the kind of a dialogue you want to have. Yeah. Right? In, in a very humorous way. Try that. Uh, here? Yeah, right there. Whatever is good. So, so now let's, let's exaggerate the rest. Listen to the silence a little longer than you should. Okay. Did you hear that actually it was exactly on time? Yeah. You didn't lengthen it. But so, I, 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 I said, I thought myself that it was too slow now. Yeah, but it wasn't. It was exactly on time. At the end, you got, but you got a little lost. Um, but in the beginning of these, that was perfect. And so when you practice, practice that, you know, practice telling those stories. And um, it will also inform your technical things because sometimes when you shorten the rests, the more you cut the rests, the more breathless um, the music becomes and it starts moving forward too fast. That's how you get this out of control acceleration. And, uh, and that eventually leads to mistakes, right? So there is a technical uh, underpinning to uh, wanting to be narrative because um, when you, the, the, the moment you let the music uh, run away from you, you're out of control. And you're usually you get faster and faster and the technique fails and then you play wrong notes. So the best remedy for that is uh, practice with exaggerated rests, listen to silences and don't let your mind rush you. Hold it back. Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. You're a terrific pianist. Do you have? Do is there any other passage in in the in the piece that you uh, have a difficulty with? Um, well, there's always. Right, and what I'm fighting to keep up? <laughs> right. So again, there. Think of it as this. So instead, of, think of it as though you it's an octave and then it's a double, no, a, a, a second. And then they're just being played not together. So you... You know, that, that really should help. Um, uh, it's when you get to the... Right? So think of it... Yeah, that helps a lot. <laughs> right? Because if you're thinking of it otherwise, you have those super, the closest interval on the piano, right? And then the, the big one. So you go like this and then like that, like this and like that. And that, at that speed, is complicated. Now, if you, in your mind, separate it into this, that, and this, and that, just played not together, you get... <laughs> becomes an easier thing. Do you see how it is? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, you bracket it for yourself. I would recommend bracketing in the music. Let me do it for you so that you know what uh, what it would look like. Yeah, I I put some brackets at the. Yeah. So this is what it would uh, look like. Oh wow! Okay. Wait. In the left hand, right? So you have two notes and then an octave, two notes and then an octave. And think of it as something 
that you're playing that is um, just two intervals that are broken as opposed to a four uncomfortable 16th notes. Yeah. That helps so much. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy that it does. Thank well, you. you're a wonderful pianist. Good luck with everything. Happy practicing. And Thank remember, you so much. remember uh, to always find a story to tell, no matter how silly. Every, you know, there are yeah. no rules. Go for it. You don't have to share that with anybody. It's your personal story. But the funnier and the sillier you will be in this music, the better you will play it. Thank you so much. It, it was really fun. <laughs> My pleasure. I'm happy to hear it. Good luck. Thank you. Sure. I'm not hearing you, Brian. Brian. Your mic's off. I was just saying, yeah, I always turn off my mic when, when I'm backstage. Uh, but I was just saying, thank you, Varaya. Great job. And uh, it was thank great you. to see you again. Yeah. It's great right. to see Pleasure you. Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Bye. All right. So we have our next uh, performer in backstage. Uh, we'll bring her in. Right. Her name is Sasha Maskoff. Uh, and uh, hi, hi. Uh, and she will be playing Rachmaninoff Prelude in G sharp minor, Opus thirty two, number twelve. Is that correct? I can't. I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, okay. Um, Constantine, you can hear me, right? I can hear you very well. Okay, so can you hear? Con oh, okay. Let's see. We will do some technical fixing. Mm -hmm. On air. Um, Sasha can't, so, okay, Sasha can't hear us. This happens more often than you think, so completely, yeah, completely normal. <laughs> That's 21st century. Mm -hmm. Um, you can't hear, okay. Audio output, okay, let's see. How about now? Can you hear us? No, can't hear us? Okay, hold on. Let me share. Um, let's see. Can you hear me? I don't think she can hear you. Uh, let's see. Uh, share screen. Let me see. I can try to uh, leave and come back very quickly. I apologize for this. I'm really sorry. I don't know what happened. No, it's okay. Let's okay. try that. Yeah, we can hear her perfectly. Yeah, we can hear her, and I think our audience can hear her. I think it's just, I think it's her audio output. Thank you, everybody, for great comments, by the way. I can see the, the chat. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Great uh, interaction with our audience. And audience, you can ask any questions you want still during the uh during the uh, master class as well um yeah well look i mean these things do happen and and uh even though we're what eight months into this <laughs> it's still a very new technology but we're truly stepping into the 21st century now with all this so we'll get better it is. it is Yes, and uh, if uh, our old old audience would know, we've had all kinds of situations. We've had we, we've had a teacher whose whose Wi-Fi uh, is is um, uh, just broke <laughs> in the middle of the talk, and we we had to use a a uh, kind of an audio uh, uh, sorry a, a a data plan <laughs> to, right. to keep, keep it on, but. I, I guess uh, we while we wait for her, I, I don't think she'll take too long. But um, I guess I'll, we'll, we'll just keep uh, talking a little bit. Um, I'll, I guess I'll bring Sherry back if, if she's ready. Uh, okay, cool. So we'll, we'll bring her back and we'll, we'll talk about uh, things and, and and we'll chat with uh, our audience as well. If if our audience have any questions, this, oh, this will be a great chance. I'm reading the chats. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I really um, like the um, comments that you, you gave to Varaya. It was just, you could really hear all these different characters come out just the way that you were describing it. Thank you. Well, you know, that, that, as I said, you know, it all comes down to, I know I sound like a soundbite, but it all comes down to being an narrative musician, right? And we all are. We all are. Because uh, at the end of the day, that's 
what the music has on the page. Um, it just it doesn't tell you. You see, it would be so much easier if the music said, oh, here, the, you know, the guy is screaming. There, the girl is picking apples. And there, the, the, the coffee has run away. And then they spill the milk. Uh, it would be easier, but it's not there. So we have to... Right. Uh, that's, uh, that's in many ways, uh, the hardest thing to do is to act out uh, the wordless scripts. Uh, because, you know, as an actor, you have words to say. Even as a singer, you have words to sing, right? So you, at least you're given the story. But we don't. Yeah. In many, many, many different ways. But you have some concrete actions that these people are doing. With our music, it's abstraction. So unless we create concrete action behind it, it can fall into that category of, sort of playing pretty or sort of being cute, but not really because we aren't being specific enough. Right. The, uh, the stuff you mentioned about listening to the silence and listening to the rests kind of reminds me of uh, John Cage's work, uh, 433, where it's uh, the, the whole song, the whole piece is, is rests. Yeah. That, that's kind of the same concept, right? That, that the rest is music as well. Oh, well, the rest are terribly important. I mean, he may have pushed it a bit. Uh, <laughs> but what I love about the piece, I love it much, is the review that it got in the New York Times. The review that, that John Cage has gotten? Yeah. Okay. It was an empty column. Oh, I, I, uh, what, what did the review say? Nothing. It was just blank column signed by the <laughs> <laughs> well, they had Interesting. Back then, right? And they had a, a page space to afford it. Yes, that's one of the best anecdotes is that after that, you know, the, the most important review was nothing. It was just Oh my God, that, that is, that's gold. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I love that. Look, uh, I, I'm all about pushing the, and being avant-garde. Sometimes if, if the whole idea is avant-garde for the sake of avant-garde, uh, I mean, it has social, uh, you know, uh, connotations and it may be important in other ways, but it ceases being an art. It becomes a social installation or performance, you know, or, or an act or action of sorts. Um, I, I do think that at the end of the day, silence is terribly important, but it, it only is important in so far as the, the sound follows. It's like, you know, the black hole is important because there is a universe uh, mm -hmm. as it's operating. The good is tangible because there's bad. Death determines and life, right? And the value of life. But without that opposite, if it's taken away, it becomes a little bit self-indulgent. Um, so, but that anyway, we don't have to get so profound. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I th I think we will take a a short break. Um, and I will we'll try to sort out the technical thing. I'll I'll. I'll Probably I'll call Sa Sasha yeah. and figure it out. And Maybe then, it's in her settings. I, I yes, it might be something on her computer that doesn't activate the mic. Yes. So we will actually take a, a short break, and then uh, as soon as we sort it out, we'll come back right back. So I'm ready to stay on and chat on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, uh, how about Sherry? How about you and uh, Constantine keep chatting, and I'll just need to call Sasha really quick. Of course. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Cool. Yeah, so are, um, are you excited about this course starting up soon? Is it, um, and is it like once a week or is it? Once a week for two hours, yes. It's okay. one, two hours and it is, uh, I'm very excited about it. It's, uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff in store. I am trying to figure out what I can tell without giving it all away. But <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're going to really look closely at, at how, uh, one would look at music as a script and then construct a narrative for the pieces that the students will choose to use for that class. And, um, and then we will, I have amazing guest speakers lined up, you know, a great actress, uh, Adler and, um, a, a wonderful, you know, physical, uh, therapist, body awareness therapist, um, and um, a fantastic composer, Paulina Nazikenska, who is watching us. Oh, awesome. Because I'm actually going to have everybody compose a piece for each other. Um, got it, got it. And there is something so cool. that Sasha can't log in. Any ideas? She's clicking the link and it can get in. So that's what's happening. Mm, okay. Um, 
and um so what what we're uh, what we're what I want to do with that is not to say that people must compose. Not everybody has to compose, but being a composer myself, I know that it is such an extraordinary uh, cognitive process that creates different relationship with music. Right, you have like a deeper appreciation for it too, and you can kind of see their the mindset of the composer. Yeah, and you start seeing yeah. what it is, what the creation of music is like. You know, how did this come about? How do ideas um, and feelings convert to sounds and to notes? Uh, right, right. Is that it's, it's, it's either a feeling or idea or both. Yeah. yeah but yeah. it doesn't just sort of write itself. You know, it's not um, an app where you shake the phone and it writes it. <laughs> it it is, is, is much less random than that. And you have to... Um, be, again, be more self-aware when you're when you're composing, and I think it, it is just a very helpful exercise for all musicians to at some point to compose something, and then then I'm going to kind of turn it around on them because I'm going to have them be in pairs and, and compose the piece, but it's somebody else that will play it, and then we will examine how uh, the interpretation of someone else differs from the intention. Of the composer, or not? Oh, that's a, that's actually a really cool experiment. I mean, I I always tell my students like, why are we ignoring certain markings that's in the score? Like, you know, there's a staccato right there, or there's a rest right there. I'm sure the composer wrote put that there for a specific reason, and yet they're ignoring it. And so, it, it's a great idea that when you just turn the tables around, yeah. and you know, you compose that work, then they will understand more the effort that goes behind every single marking. Right, but and also look, nothing should ever be gratuitous. So, right, right. Um, meaning, all right, if you're choosing to ignore a marking, there needs to be a good enough reason to, and it may be a good reason. In fact, it may be for the better of the piece, but it has to be informed. It's, you know, like Picasso, before he went into the cubism, you know, he drew beautifully. And so in order to disregard the rules, you have to learn how to use them first. And then you can graduate from that. And then you can say, well, you know, because I know all of that. You can bend it. And put it away because I now know this. And I think this is more important. But simply saying, oh, none of that matters. I'm just going to, you know, splatter stuff all over. And what comes, comes, you know, that that's not art that's uh something else and there's a lot of it in in music and interpretation as well you know people just do whatever because they feel like it right i think sasha's back let's try yeah. it again yeah hi hi sasha can you hear us yes sorry about Yay. that Yay. Oh, no worries no worries it's a growing pains of 21st century great okay so we'll, we'll get right started yes so excited with rahman you know Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Congratulations. So I'm mean, just curious, um, do where are you when you're playing this piece? Um, I imagine myself to be in a Russian village with a um, uh, snow-covered Russian village in the winter with uh, like sleigh bells passing by because mm -hmm. that's what I hear in the right hand. So yeah. That's beautiful. That, and I totally can see that. That's, that's very good. It's very important because I asked you because for me it was always also uh, a, a countryside uh, Russian from my early childhood memories, but the rain, to me, this whole thing sounds like an autumn rain, like this cold gray, sort of endless rain, you know, this whole. And so the melody is, you know, when, when you're looking out at, through the window uh, that is rained on like this. Yeah. Uh, the images aren't clear because the, the, the glass is wet. So everything appears a little bit grotesque, a little bit out of focus. And that, to me, that is the music. So the right hand is this perpetual rain, but the melody in the left hand is, 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 is there, but it's slightly out of focus. And so there's this quality to it that makes it very poetic in, in my view, but it could also be winter. So, um, I, I feel that you can create more mystery in, in it. You're phrasing very nicely and you're projecting very nicely, but it's almost, it's too real, you know, it's too clear yeah. in a sense. So I'm trying to reach this kind of quality to it. That... <laughs> Can you hear that? Like it's it's kind of there, but not quite all the way. So a little lighter touch, and also as far as the phrasing is concerned, allow yourself to breathe. So right hand is autonomous, right? It's like a Tesla. It's on an autopilot. It's self-driving, and it has to be very even. And yours is so just. Stick with it. So whatever right hand is doing, but the left hand, feel start counting in the second bar, and feel. Make it as simple as you can. Yours was a little bit, a little bit too much espressivo to my taste. Yeah. So if you make it a little bit more simple and feel that it also, it always goes from the, um, um, from the short to the long. So it's right. Don't get stuck on there. Not that you are, I vastly exaggerated it, but I, this is an overall, a precaution that I think is important in this piece is not to get stuck on on the uh, on the short notes because it, it the the lilt of the melody always goes short long short long short long mm -hmm. and um, when you get to these unusual ones you can make it a little bit more surprising right so we don't know that anything is changing because you've been sitting in the same key for four bars right it's the same harmony, right? J 
just for one second it exits and then it comes right back to the same harmony so enjoy find meaning in it in a sense that don't prepare it as much surprise yourself with that chord and then kind of go back to it do you want to start Very, very good. What I would do is I would roll the left, her, uh, left hand faster so that there's less preparation because when you roll it so slow, when you go, we already know that something is happening before you played the melody because it's really, so I would roll it. Almost like not, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of rolled chords to be honest. It, it's, um, it's a very particular trait of 19th century uh, music, uh, all Western music. It began in Western salons and transferred over to Russia. And it is part of the golden, uh, golden age style of playing. Everybody rolls everything. But I think it, it's a little bit, uh, it breaks the spell. So if you can minimize the roll, it's not a very big chord. I'm sure you can reach it even to play together. I mean, Rachmaninoff didn't write it together, so let's not be presumptuous. But roll it as though you're not rolling it. Because what, what really we wanna hear is the tritone. Right, that's where the, the, the that je ne sais quoi, you know, that, that surprise is. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. And then continue the thought. So the idea here is that it's so, it is a stream of consciousness. You know, this is a sketch of your state of mind. This is not a very definitive story. Nothing happens, at least in my narrative, right? No one's going anywhere. No one's encountering anybody. There is no argument per se. You're looking out at the world through that wet window or snow frosted window in the winter. You don't see clearly also, right? Because there's a, a frosting on the glass and you're seeing this kaleidoscope of the world outside and your thoughts kind of um, wander, right? And that's the beauty of the phrase because it's very asymmetrical. Your phrase doesn't end where you stop. It goes. That's your entire melody. It never stops. Yeah. So it is so odd. It's weird. And that its beauty is in that weirdness because you don't know where you're going with this. You're just looking at something that is not clear and you're trying to make out what you're seeing and you don't know where it's going to take you. Try that. From the beginning? Try from the beginning and imagine literally that you're, um, that you don't know this music and that you just don't know when to end your phrase. Like you're saying something and you you just keep talking, you know, like some people ramble on. So ramble on for me a little bit <laughs> musically, right? Just keep, don't let the phrase fall. Keep it going forward. Thank you. 
very do, so do, do you hear i think how much more picturesque it becomes when you do that and you can do a little bit more with dynamic just just die you know thin out the sound even more but phrasing phrasing wise phraseology wise it was much closer to how i feel the music uh, mm -hmm. this particular piece now i would play with the color with that change when it goes to major through the harmonic major right so you have this whole thing <laughs> Sorry. Right, so that you can give a little bit of more um, magic there. How do you do that? Um, change pedal right away cleanly on that harmony and drop the dynamic and show. So that resolve that. Yeah, very good, very good. And then you also have, um, if you listen to, uh, this is an interesting concept, if you listen to it, almost like a Morse code, right? <laughs> then you have. Well, you know what it becomes later on? That. You have the and then then you have um, it's all one melody. Yeah. And it all comes out of that Morse code that you have there. That to me that's that's the rain, you know, that's the sort of the rain dripping on you. And then if you just track it with your ear, and then when you get there, um, you play it really, really well. I would like this. Um, more splashy, you know, uh, sp like uh, sp splashy, not in a way splashy, but more liquid, more organic. Um, Get there faster from here because I feel arrival. You know, I feel separations there when you play it. I exaggerated because I'm not sure how well uh, internet trans translates that. But try to unify it. So these things. It's just splashes of water, you know, like when a carriage or a car drives through the puddle and you just get splashed with water. That's kind of, that's what those little crescendi are. They're not events that you don't have to take time. It just happens as it does. But in a way, you know, to my taste, one of the keys to playing Rachmaninoff meaningfully is to, uh, the less is more. So you don't have to, be as expressive because music is incredibly picturesque and expressive for you. So if you if you have very fine sounds and touch and under and, and those co concepts, it will tell the story. It will kind of become more expressive. If you overdo it, it becomes overtly expressive. And then it becomes sort of much ado about nothing because there is nothing going on here really. So to create tension when there isn't is inauthentic um not that you are I mean, you're you're not inauthentic but i'm just saying i'm kind of forewarning what i hear might happen uh so unify that as you can and then when you get there also uh there try to roll your left hand notice even the way that it's written you have sorry so all these all these notes should happen before the um, right. So try whatever fingers you're using. A 
attach them to the previous bar so that ideally in slow motion it sounds like this because you want to make sure that the music is this as opposed to this got it got it so that break breaks the melodic line so fit it in before mm -hmm. and immediately when you get there here is the Rachmaninoff loves these collapsing phrases so your phrase always starts higher and then it kind of falls down and here you have four of these in succession and they come out of a course of this so you have Create is more of this. As opposed to this. I mean, again, I'm exaggerating. You're not quite doing it, but you were interpreting, you were playing them essentially how people play Schumann or, or Beethoven phrase, you know, with that sort of sense of um build up to this kind of arch mm -hmm. but rachmaninovs are more like a financial meltdown they're they're like this mm -hmm. <laughs> it's 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 a crash mm -hmm. uh, you know it's it, it's not <laughs> a normal volatile behavior so you want to start with an energy and relax start with an energy and relax and that means also don't fiddle with time too much so don't Go da 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 da. You know, non non parlando. Uh, more. Listen to the top note. If you actually put the pedal cleanly on it. Sorry, I'm sitting and pedaling at an angle, so it's all wrong. But do you hear what I mean? Try that. Very good. Try a little bit more of the right hand, but I suspect I'm hearing more left because your phone is on the left. The computer, yeah. The computer. Yeah, or the computer. So uh, just, just hang on to those. And you can actually overhold them a little bit. So when you do this, you can slow the left hand a little bit. And I mean microns, right? But you can go. So that when you get here and here, it's really to me, really like when the rain Oh, Siri decided to join us. <laughs> when the rain picks up, you know, when you have more splashes, the right hand is your rain splashes. So you... And of course, genius Rachmaninoff who loves polyphony, you have a counterpoint. Your left hand is going. And the right hand is going. So they're, they're really kind of in a dialogue almost. But here, listen to your left hand and phrase it just like this. You know? so. And in all... And then... So it creates this avalanche of water, which eventually spills over in this, you know. All of that becomes, you know, that's your uh, uh, rainstorm. Okay. Try that.
if I may, uh, yes. So you're rushing a little bit. You actually, if you listen to yourself, you go. You're going a little bit like this. Keep it, hold back and don't. And remember, start more and less. So if it, you it start, even it's all pianissimo to begin with, right? It's super piano, softest you can do. And so it's kind of like a shimmer. It's almost like a Debussy-like sound. Do you know what I mean? It has to be so shimmering and transparent. I know it's very hard. It's much harder to do it that way than to play it louder. Very good, excellent. So uh, here my recommendation is because both of us see that taking place in a Russian village. Um, I think this to me sounds like um, like a Russian choir church uh, sung by men, you know, by basses. Yeah. Uh, if when basses sing, uh, real basses that low, they're always behind the beat. They're always slower. They can't, that voice does not move. It's opposite of soprano, right? It doesn't move fast at all. So that's why he says menomoso, you know, but menomoso is sitting in the, up by the right hand and nobody kind of knows what to do with it. So they just slow down the right hand. What this menomoso stands for, I think, is it tells you that what used to be your personal thought, imagine like in the beginning, what we're hearing, Maybe it's our thought. We're hearing our, ourselves think and feel whatever we're looking at. But here, all of a sudden, the same idea is reflected back at you from the distance by a bunch of men at a church. I mean, that's pretty heavy. So you, what does that mean? Slow down. Slow down and voice the left hand. Forget about your right hand. It will play itself. Don't even listen to it. What you want to hear, because this is a kind of a heartbreak moment, is after all of this uh, splashing around, literally, you know, or you go. There's a sense of finality. It's almost like a funereal almost. It has to be almost borderline scary. And don't anticipate this because this is your reaction. So let this play out. Right, so this is your saying, but no, 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 no. You know, everything's fine, we're alive, it's just the rain. Right, it's, it's the moment of waking up. So imagine you're like closing your eyes and what, you, what you're hearing with your eyes closed. And your reaction is, that's when you wake up and you say no. Mm -hmm. okay. right. I know it's, it's a lot, I'm, not, I'm putting you on the spot, but just try it, it's fine. Thank 
So that, that was very, very good. Remember, I know that's a lot, too much to think about all at once, but while doing everything you did, which sounded great, don't, don't overhaul the short notes. Short, long, short, long, still the same, right? Don't. Because the danger here is that it starts sounding like a, dupl you know, a duplet. It is two against three, and it's, it's not, right? So just, just make sure, yours doesn't, but it, it really, I think, is very important that it goes da 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 da, and then uh, when you get there, allow the music to take you up. So this uh, left hand was great. This. beautiful and it creates a more desperate it's one of these things where you know somebody screams and then they just kind of catch themselves going way overboard and they say oh well, no it's okay um that's kind of the end for me um i think so when you create this large verse don't let it hover upstairs hold on to it and then bring it down and then when and then this really might as well have been the end of the piece so play all of this is pure paysage, you know, like, like uh, it's a total that you see, absolutely sort of ambient noises. There is no more substantive melody there. And this kind of suspended in the air, don't take any time. Mm -hmm. And I would say, like I hold my breath, right? So the thing about breath is that uh, audience breathes with you and they see you breathe. And, and you can use that uh, great, uh, to a great advantage for your narrative. So here you want that sense of something just vanishing into the air, into the thin air, like it's just disappeared in front of you yeah. and and people have to be sort of like oh like wow and the only way to really do it is to hold your breath at the end don't let the finality of the end take care close it because if there's a double bar and the way to the way to put the double bar is to do this and with this you finished it, right? So it's it's over. Um, the piece is over, and you're, everybody's supposed to clap. But if you allow it to kind of disappear into the air, and you're not breathing, like the time is stopped, like it's then it really has an effect on the listener that I think really uh, you know you want. I think everybody wants that effect at the end of this piece because it's so magical, and it has to finish magically, you know. 
um, it has to disappear by a wave of a magic wand. <laughs> Try that. So I better don't slow down and don't use the pedal at the end, at the very end. That's it. Yeah, try not to slow down. Believe it or not, you're still slowing down. Yeah. Yes, yeah, much better. Yeah, so try just completely flat, no, you know, non-crescendo, non-ritenuto, uh, just ta 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 And that's it. Yes, yes, much better. But so you you know, film yourself doing it and, and find your own way of doing you know. Uh it's it's um you know, no one should just do it like I say, you know, you find your own but that's the I I think the idea. And um your playing is already so good of it that but you can make it more three D, you know, more um more narratively realized, you know, so that we can feel if it's winter, we have to feel a little cold. The whole thing has to be very cold, you know, and if, if it snows, you know, we have to like feel shivers from the snow falling all over us. Um, you know, the very cold sound don't, um, don't allow the sounds to become too rich yeah. because that kind of richness of sound warms it up. This piece is icicles. It's it's all very you know crystal. Do you have any particular technical um, issue that you would like to take up? Not really. It I doesn't sound like you do, but you know one one never does. <laughs> no, I just I'm working on the sound itself. Not right now. No, I don't have any technical questions. Yeah. No. Look, I mean, you're doing a beautiful job. I think you're just playing it already great. Are you playing any of the other ones? Um, I'm playing, I haven't played uh, any other Rahman, of Rahmanov's preludes, but I'm doing uh, etude, an etude tableau. Etude tableau? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Which one? Uh, the Red Riding Hood. The, uh, oh, that's great. Yeah. And well, that's very narrative. Yeah. And if, uh, uh, oh, they're all great. But, you know, when, when generally when you uh, ask yourself, particularly in this music, it's always good to uh, ask yourself, where are you? Is it cold or is it warm? Like what time of the year is it? And, um, and you know, what, with Rachmaninoff, you always have to look for, um, look for the loss in his music. There's always a, a a lacking of something that what makes it so moving. There is also a presence of of God. You know, he was very religious, um, and whether or not we are, it's it's it doesn't matter. But what matters is that we understand that for him it was important. So we need to. There's always God somewhere there. There's always a church cadence. There's always something that reminds us of a Russian church, whether it be its music or a harmony or uh, bells, you know, he's obsessed with bells, as we all know, Dies Irae everywhere, hello, Paganini variations, uh, right? So there's always some religious connotation hidden in the music. Yeah. And that is his salvation, you know, that is his uh, uh, something permanent that holds him together uh, against a sense of loss, the sense of loss of his country, famously. I mean, it's not a secret. I'm not inventing anything here. He was very depressed most of his life because the, the Tsarist Russia ceased to exist. And, and he was kind of in the, that sort of uh, in search of paradise lost, and he never found it. And it, it permeates his music just in different ways. Every piece has it but they have it in different shapes and different forms. And it's, it's incredibly uh, gratifying to look for that and to find it and to then resonate with it in your own particular way. I highly recommend watching, um, it's on YouTube, 
maybe you already have a documentary uh, about him called The Harvest of Sorrow. I haven't, but I'll watch it. Okay. It's, uh, the whole thing is on YouTube. It's like two hours. It's BBC. It's wonderfully done. And it's it's very depressing, and it's uh, it's a great way of seeing his life through his music, you know, in a political and social context. And um, you, everyone who cares and plays Rachmaninoff should see it because you learn a lot. I have uh, from it, and and it gives you um, further ideas how to interpret his music. I think. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Sasha, for um, being a part of Piano Star Masterclass. You sounded wonderful. I hope you had a great experience. No, thank you. Thank you so much. It was really helpful and just a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, it's our um, pleasure. So okay. glad that, that we heard you play. Thank you. Okay. See you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Constantine, for just you know sharing these almost two hours of wisdom and you know sharing about the one thing that you're so passionate about. Uh, I mean we can see that it just oozes out of you and we feel it. And we just, we're now able to walk away with um, that idea of being a storyteller um, in our performances or maybe in the way that we're teaching for teachers. So thank you again so much for being on the show. Sure. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me guys. Of course. And we want to just thank, um, you, the audience, for you know watching uh, today's masterclass. We hope that you guys got something out of it as well. Uh, we'll, um, as usual, have our masterclasses uh, every Tuesdays, uh, and uh, we hope that we will see you again next week. Yes, uh, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter, uh, where we'll have all our updates. Um, with that said, thank you, Constantine. Thank you, everyone. Thank um, you. Happy practicing, as we always said, uh, as we always say at Piano League. Um, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.